Zambula, you're watching Bhutan This Week. I'm Choni Zuk Selden. In the headlines. 14 people in the country test positive for Omicron variant. Government decides to compensate to Dayang owners. Gainful employment crucial for addressing human trafficking. Now the details. The Royal Centre for Disease Control has detected the first cases of the Omicron variant in the country on Thursday. 14 random samples collected from various quarantine facilities tested positive for the Omicron variant. Among them is the community case from Finsling. The rest of the cases are all imported. The Health Ministry collected samples from quarantine facilities in Thimpu, Wandifoda and Finsling and Paro. A lot of people are traveling around the country amid the pandemic. And traveling from high to low risk areas requires mandatory seven day quarantine. But providing the service is becoming difficult. In Sarbang, the increasing number of travelers is putting a huge pressure on the quarantine facilities. These people have come to the old Dungkak office to confirm their quarantine request. Most of them have waited for more than a week to even register for quarantine. Among them, some are on their way home to attend to their ailing parents while students came for different winter activities. I registered for quarantine through a call a week ago. But today, I came to know that my request was not registered. I registered again today and they told me that it is going to take another two weeks. They said they would call us within two to three days. My mother is seriously ill at home, but here it has been more than a week since they did not call us for the confirmation. I registered on 23rd of last month, and ever since I have been waiting for confirmation. Today I have come to confirm if my quarantine request is through. Of more than 40 hotels used as quarantine facilities in Sarpang, some 30 are identified for routine travellers. The remaining and the 200-bedded facility constructed recently are for incoming expatriates. And with over 3,000 outbound travellers registered with the task force, it has put so much pressure on the existing facilities. To solve this issue at the earliest possible, he said the Secretariat is looking to expand their quarantine facilities in the newly constructed buildings. Meanwhile, the office facilitates a transport service to those who don't have vehicles and also keeps people in quarantine in other districts. For Karmawandi in Sarpang, Cheku for BBS News. To resolve the egg shortage in the country, eggs will be imported from India. The Bhutan Livestock Development Corporation will import more than a million eggs in the first consignment. It is an interim measure for up to four or five months. Since December last year, the production of eggs went down after poultry birds across the country were fed suspected contaminated bird feed. Zirang, the country's highest egg-producing district, reported a decline in egg production to almost zero. The poultry farmers in the district say that most of their birds have not laid any eggs since the recent incident. Most of the birds either died or have been left seriously ill. In Thimpu, eggs have become a rare commodity in shops, with prices becoming exorbitantly high. A tray of eggs currently costs anywhere from 500 to some even paying a thousand item. According to the BLDCL, they will make changes with the amount of eggs to import and the frequency according to the demand. <laughs> Bafra has a list of suppliers that we used to import eggs from in the past. For now, we have identified one or two agencies in Tamil Nadu from where we will import the eggs. Tamil Nadu 
According to a notification issued by the Ministry of Agriculture and Forests, a tray of eggs will be sold at retail price of 285 nitum to 305 nitum depending on the zongkak. We will sell one egg at 9.50 nitum in Timpu. But even beyond Timpu, places like Paro, Timpu, Wandi, Punaka, Gasa and Ha will have the same price. And beyond Wandi, Bumta, Trongsa, it will be 10 nitrum. According to data with the Agriculture Ministry, more than 480,000 birds were affected. The daily egg production declined by almost 70% from more than 380,000 in a day to just over 120,000. As per the BLDCL, a day-old chick or DOC takes at least five months to mature and start laying eggs. They're hoping that egg production in the country will resume by that time. In 2020, people in the country consumed about 172 million eggs. Something Dolker, BBS News. People young and old and from various aspects of life in the country can insure their life with different insurance policies. However, when it comes to crop and livestock insurance, people don't seem to have an option. Both the insurance companies in the country do not provide crop and livestock insurances. The RICB wants to do it, but are hesitant because most farmers might not be able to afford it. Every year, farmers losing thousands of acres of crops to natural disasters, pests and diseases become national headlines. Likewise, farmers are also never excused by wild predation of their animals coupled with diseases. Just recently, more than 500 poultry farmers in the country lost their source of income following a suspected feed contamination incident. Amid such adversities, farmers say lack of insurance scheme piles up their plight. Regarding the insurance to the houses that were built for the poultry, but there is no scheme regarding the poultry that we put inside those houses. And if there is an opportunity for us to get the insurance for the poultry and other livestock that we put for the business, then it would be great help. <laughs> According to the RICB, crop and livestock insurances will be expensive because the risk for the company is high and feel that most farmers in the country won't be able to pay the premium. They are suggesting that the government help out. Every country, even the most developed country like Japan, supports insurance by the state. Instead of relief, what happens is you mainstream it, you make the product. Okay, so once you do that, then there's a sharing of the risk between the insured and the state. In many cases, state pick up more than 80% of the premium. But that is cheaper than giving hundreds and thousands of uh, money compensation to the farmers. If there is government intervention, the company said they are ready to provide the crop and livestock insurance schemes. Meanwhile, the government is discussing either to help farmers pay a certain percent of the premium or for the insurance company to subsidize the premium amount. Commercial farming from day one, the ministry that this is a business activity. See, and many insurance courses encourage pay, but the badalu that to sense ki banalu the ani premium pay be be the insurance dem be be the namse me mindu section be la. Ani subsistence farming ite ka hipta be achin the da nyamalara achina through endowment fund support or through kidu support. Ani zumbera dem be dui bendi ki the da to dorora achigi insurance introduce be badalu the subsistence farming ki premium payment the namse me. Uh, yeah, high rate baton. As per international articles, besides savings, insuring assets greatly help achieve financial freedom.
and ensuring crops and livestock against any threat could provide farmers a huge financial relief. Something Dolker, BBS News. Nearly two decades after venturing into coffee farming, farmers in Samsi got a reliable market within the country. Mountain Cafe and Roastery in Paro has started buying their coffee, ch coffee cherries, reviving their interest to grow coffee again. One of the first coffee growers in Pemalingeok in Samsi is 50-year-old Mina Kumari Sarki. She started with 10 saplings in her backyard. Three years later, when the plants started fruiting, there was no market. She had no idea how to make it edible either. And just like that, it went to waste every year. Last year, I got over 40 kilograms of coffee beans, but it all went to waste. Like Mina, 42-year-old Tika Gurung is also among the many who saw coffee farming as an alternate source of income. She said growing coffee is easier than growing vegetables and other cash crops. Earlier, our source of income was orange, but the yield had been reducing every year. Moreover, we lose most of it to the monkeys, whereas only goats and cows eat the leaves of coffee. It is much easier to grow coffee for now. We have to water the plants during the dry season and put some manure. That's it. Farmers in Pemalingyog received 10 coffee saplings each in 2003. However, Tika Gurung said most of the farmers gave up since there was no market, even when the harvest was bountiful. And for those who never gave up, they were not disappointed. The market for the coffee finally arrived in the form of a businessman from Paro. Last year, he collected over 3,000 kilograms of coffee cherries from them. <laughs> We harvest coffee beans starting October till February. We can harvest it thrice in a year. There are almost 200 families with coffee plants. Some have five plants while some have hundreds. I paid 60 newton a kilogram. His love for coffee drove him to start a cafe in 2016 in Paro Town. But the love story started turning bitter when the best brand of coffee failed to make his patrons happy. That is when he decided to produce coffee. He bought two acres of land in Samsi to grow coffee on large scale. I have constructed a nursery and raised over 20,000 coffee saplings. I sought state land on lease to transplant the coffee plants, but I didn't get the land. Then I supplied the saplings to the people, assuring them that I would buy back the product in three years as it starts fruiting in three years. We also made an agreement. He took a loan of nearly 6 million Niltrum to buy raw materials and procure machinery for roasting and packaging. Karma says, if all goes well, he will replace the imported coffee in the local market and export as well. I have been getting orders and inquiries asking for coffee in bulk from abroad. Unfortunately, I am not able to do so. And looks like I won't be able to do that for the next three years. I am hopeful that after three years when my plants start fruiting, I will be able to meet their demands. For now, I am not able to meet even the local demand. I'm focusing on producing and branding organic coffee. It is quite a journey to put a steaming cup of coffee on the table. And the excitement is more when the coffee on the table is roasted and brewed locally. There is a pride that the coffee you are sipping will not only help the farmers, but will also contribute to the country's economy. For Namigomachu in Paro, Chiku for BBS News. The government has released a notification regarding its decision on the supporting measures and compensation to Dayang owners and its employees. The measures include monetary compensation to the owners and skilling programs for the employees. 
The Ministry of Economic Affairs, the Labor Ministry and the Finance Ministry released the joint notification on Thursday. The government recently issued an executive order for the closure of all dayangs in the country. According to the notification, the owners who have retained their dryang until the issuance of the executive order shall be provided with one and a half million yultam, and those who have surrendered their rented space in 2020 shall be provided with one million yultam. The dryang owners who have availed loans from the National CSI Development Bank that the government offered during the pandemic shall have the principal loan amount recovered from the compensation amount. According to the Finance Minister, the compensation amounts were decided in consultation with the relevant offices. <laughs> Shiop condescending Gibero, the Masagon the Jushimda, Diang Redish in Duchalu, the Tritinze, the Nalapangache, Godam Gobroch Bebojin, Kutudi, Putangi, Kutudi Pudalu, the Shi Cachilu Jactipi Kutipine Imina, Sidi, the Diang di Gutsub Dolu Seda Cachida Cachigo Yasiga, Anigi, Ninjulu Digulu, report Digulu Shit and Dibangachi Catholic Kutipu in Sessionilla. Meanwhile, the drying employees will also be provided with various upskilling and skilling programs. The notification states that drying owners wishing to take part in other entertainment businesses will also receive government support. Kelsang Choden for BBS News. Meanwhile, the drying owners are not happy with the government's decision. The drying association says the compensation amount is not enough to cover their losses. They are my good in any way, they will shake his they will only keep it in my miss Shunila. That is to say, Kala Tamidi, Kala Tuni, Lama Lanchi, the Shunginan case, they will soon give it to Lula. Catch you searching Kala to start over the Luluchi Donang up to Luluchi Bumchi, the Tonta Cave Eula, and even the Longo need this Bodolo, Gadim Shum, Mush, let the Bumke, Lakam Chet, the Tapsanovala, the Mila Lugutusha Nanda, Tiru Yumip Kala, Tang Luna Messe, they will remember Shinalo, Kala Tuni, Tiru Chira Melambe, Sushinila, Tangachi Tang, the Sukotam Tamigi, the Gutu de Tigiran Sube. The police are carrying out a court of inquiry against a police officer accused of sexually harassing a female constable at Nganglom in Pemagasa recently. In a court of inquiry, a tribunal is appointed to investigate a matter and decide whether a court martial is necessary. The case came into the limelight after an anonymous person posted about it on social media recently. In this post, a person wrote an open letter to the chief of police seeking justice for the female police constable. The person also alleges that the officer and the chief of police solved the case internally and transferred the woman to Thimpu. To authenticate the incident, BBS called the woman several times but could not get in touch with her. However, BBS spoke to her elder sister over the phone who was aware of the incident. The female constable told her sister that the police officer used to bother her at work and he would even show up at her house. The officer is accused of inappropriate touching and sending lewd photos. The female constable is said to have asked for a transfer, but the officer declined her request. The female constable joined the service last year. She added that her sister also informed the officer's wife about the incident only to learn that he had previously committed a similar offence. The police officer denied the allegations. The chief of police, on the other hand, said he did not receive any complaint about the case but saw the post a few days ago. Nevertheless, he said the investigation is underway. He also added that sexual harassment will not be tolerated and that the officer will be dealt with according to the law if proven guilty. Pimasaldun Singh, BBS News. As per police records, there were 75 rape cases reported across the country last year. This was an increase of more than 41% of cases reported in 2020. The police say that most of the perpetrators were found to have mental health disorders, followed by those under the influence of alcohol or drugs. 
According to the police, the number of rape cases last year increased by 22 cases compared to the previous year. In 2020, there were 53 reported cases. Most of the rape victims were children aged between 12 and 18 years. Almost 60 cases were reported in this age group. It was followed by statutory rape, which is the rape of minors below 12 years or of an incompetent person. There were eight cases. Despite manpower shortage, the police say they are intensifying inspections and patrolling. The police are also urging the Tomde and concerned authorities to install CCTV cameras, especially in isolated places and wherever required. Furthermore, the police said it is the responsibility of an individual, particularly the females, to avoid going out during odd hours or in secluded places. Bima Saldun Singh, PBS News. If there is one intervention that can help curb human trafficking, it is creating gainful employment in the job market. This is according to the National Prevention and Response Strategy on Trafficking in Persons. The Department of Law and Order launched the national strategy on Wednesday. As per the department, most of the past cases relating to trafficking in persons in the country are a result of unsafe labor migration with many Bhutanese traveling abroad in hope of better employment opportunities. The National Strategic Plan recognizes fulfilling their social and economic development needs as important elements in preventing trafficking in persons. It has been found that factors such as poverty, unemployment, gender inequality and family problems make a person more vulnerable to trafficking. And easy access to internet and consumerism are making it easier for traffickers to identify and target the vulnerable people. The strategic plan prioritizes conducting research, raising awareness, building institutional capacity and formulating policies and programs for high-risk individuals. It also focuses on enhancing bilateral, regional and multilateral collaboration to make it easier to repatriate Bhutanese if they are trafficked abroad. With more and more Bhutanese individuals aspiring to work abroad, the possibility of Bhutanese falling prey to the criminals of trafficking in persons is a matter of grave concern. And therefore, it is of utmost importance to prepare and build mechanisms towards combating this threat. As we all know, legal interventions alone will not be able to deal with the issues of social concerns. This strategy paper is basically uh, to guide all the uh, relevant stakeholders as to what their responsibilities are in terms of uh, dealing with the issues of uh, trafficking in person. It also includes the National Action Plan. So basically we'll have a lot of identified activities uh, for three years uh, according to which the, all these sectors and relevant stakeholders who are engaged or involved in this particular uh, areas are supposed to uh, do. The Department of Law and Order will implement a national strategy with nine other relevant agencies. They are the Office of the Attorney General, Foreign Affairs Ministry, Ministry of Labor and Human Resources, National Commission for Women and Children, Police, Immigration Department, Department of Adult and Higher Education, Jimmy Dojiwanshu National Referral Hospital and Renew. As per the Department of Law and Order, currently there are 30 suspects involved in trafficking in persons. Cases against 11 suspects have already been forwarded to the OAG. Gilladim for BBS News. It has been more than two years now since the 720 megawatt Mandichu plant in Tonsa started generating electricity and revenue. However, some residents of Kinga Raptin and some Choling Khamid in Tonsa are still unhappy with the monetary compensation received for damages caused to their houses. They claim the damages were due to the project's tunnel constructed near the settlement. 64-year-old Nado takes us to his house in Samchalin Kame. Several cracks have developed in his house, which he said is situated just above the powerhouse. He said the major cracks appeared sometime in 2020. <laughs> 
দিলে জংখানা কে দিলে মা ঘর ডাস দিছিল মিটিং এ চাপছি হিস হরে তাও জুই না তাও জুই দিবে দেবের সামনে দেখো দিছি ছাড়ে বে মতো The problem doesn't end here. Holes like this have appeared in his fields. He is one of the worst affected residents here. The project compensated 19 households in 2020, but many want the concerned offices to carry out a thorough investigation again and review the compensation in consultation with the affected households. Meanwhile, 11 new reports of damages are still with the Georg office. হেমালে সাথে তো তো মিন্দু সাথে আনি মেসলা মেবা দিনা ছুঙ্গালে এই ফোনালে থেমচি না দি দিগে মিবেন্দি গে হেমা দি গাগায় মিলান এম ইসি গোচু বে জুদু মারেম চিনালে আছে গানি গোচু ইলানি দি দিলে খোলু ইসি বেদন খুঁগি তুরু ছাম ছিমরি জিন দিগি নাচি ছিগালে ফা আছে উষা বেদন না না গি দিন দাম ছাদে লিগ মেলা দিস গারা জি হাতে থিম দিস গারা গাবে কামতি মাজো না The project officials said residents were compensated in consultation with relevant stakeholders. The authority added they observed the situation and even installed monitoring equipment but found no further damages. The tunnel was also said to be structurally stable. For Pasa in Trongsa, Sring Dandup, PBS News. The recently held President's Cup in Monger is being called the biggest football tournament organized by the Bhutan Football Federation in the eastern region. The tournament has also been a boon for the business community of Gelpushing and Lingmithang towns in Monger. Even though it was just for two weeks, businesses in the town made the most of the event. The restaurants which remained without visitors until recently are getting filled these days. The footballers and officials visit them every day to grab a meal or some snacks. It has been good business for the restaurant owners who have been running in a loss amid the pandemic. Himalaya chip the the as the director drive is scheduled the Kong Disu the Mi Disu na Pung Be the The tournament is also benefiting the hoteliers with most of their hotel rooms booked by the officials accompanying the footballers. Only a few customers used to visit our hotel, but these days, due to the football tournament, all our rooms are booked by the officials and it helps our business when they live and eat in our hotel. And it doesn't end there. The retail shops and the vegetable vendors of Gelpushing are also reaping equal benefits. Seven teams, including the top five clubs from the Bhutan Premier League, are competing in the BFF President's Cup that kicked off from Wednesday. For Sonam Tsring in Monga, Kelsang Choden for BBS News. That's all for this week. I'm Choni Zuk Seldon. Thank you for watching. Goodbye and stay safe.